So this may seem mildly familiar, back in about like 2020 during the cursed era of 15 days, I released a video that quickly got struck down. So after, I don't know, about like 30 attempts at re-uploading it, I just kind of decided to let it go. But it turns out I actually really do like this movie, and I'd say my writing has gotten better since then. That's my delusions anyways. So I'm actually just going to remake the entire thing, not re-upload it. So there's gonna be different points and different breakdowns because you know what, why not? In a small town known as Wilsey, South Carolina, a parasite would touch down on Earth and at first require a suitable host. It just so happens that a pair of inebriated adults were just walking by shortly after the meteorite touched down and released a fleshy container. Shortly after infection, the host would begin exhibiting some strange mutations physically as well as mental instability that would allow for the parasite to grow and continue spreading across the town and at the complete detriment to the other hosts involved in the process. In today's episode, we will talk about the actual movie because it's got Nathan Fillion in it as well as just the nastiest monster possible as well as his mutations and the failing neurology behind the alpha host. He's an alpha because he needs others and needs breeders to build his hive. So he's not a true alpha like a sigma. Okay, that's enough of that nonsense. Let's get to it. But first, this episode is sponsored by Raycon. Are you planning on shaking things up and challenging yourself this year? Well, if you are, then great news. You can make Raycon a part of that. Using my link in the description or heading to buyraycon.com forward slash Roanoke, you can get 15% off your Raycon purchase today. With Raycons, they will stay in your ears with a secure fit. Whether you be working out, running, headbanging, or for some reason, parkouring through the woods through an apocalyptic society. Plus, at half the price of other premium audio brands, optimized gel tips, as well as a 32-hour battery life and 8 hours of continuous playtime, and added to all that, the everyday earbuds have over 48,000 five-star reviews. The reality is these earbuds are perfect for any active lifestyle. I personally use them when I'm working on a car because every 20 minute project is about one snapped bolt away from being a weekend ordeal. Or when I'm writing scripts and rather than, you know, having music just blare through the house, I just have them blaring into my ear holes. So again, using my link in the description or heading to buyraycon.com forward slash Roanoke, you can get 15% off your order today. All right, let's get back to it. So for all those that are new here, there is a timestamp up on screen. If you want to bypass the summary and head straight to the science, then jump to there. Although so if you haven't seen this movie yet, it's like one of those corny comedy horror movies that's like really intentionally funny. So if you just don't want it spoiled, I'd say definitely it's worth a watch. For all others, let's get into why when a meteorite shoots a dart down your sternum, you should probably just go straight to the hospital and not back to your house to sleep it off unless you were just feeling like destroying a whole town for funsies. So we kick off our story in the same way a lot of alien movies start, a giant hunk of rock flying towards Earth. As a police officer sits outside measuring the flight of an unladen swallow, which happens to be 27 miles per hour just for your information, he laments over his inability to detect something within 2 miles per hour. The meteorite lands behind them because it actually has the right stuff, so that's the difference between a meteor and a meteorite. And then we get our title, Slither, as well as a flesh meteorite opening up. Also, if I sound weird, I have allergies right now and they're absolutely killing me. We now get your typical shot of a standard South Carolina town. Look, I'm not dugging on people from South Carolina, but I've been through there a few times. What are y'all doing there exactly? Like, I'm only in Georgia, but crossing over between the border of states, it feels like there's just nothing there. So anyways, through the pan through, we see a sweet 1978 Ford Bronco. Something about a square body 4x4 on big wheels that says, yeah, during the apocalypse, I can at least head out into the woods. Meanwhile, the mayor yells from his inferior 1967 Imperial LeBaron. Although that was an excellent year for Impala. He just picked the wrong car. Anyways, we now meet Starla Grant, who is teaching her biology class. She's talking about how cockroaches have been on this planet for about 300 50 million years and humans only about 2 million years. So who's more successful? I don't know, that kind of sounds like some bug propaganda to me. But her students aren't really paying attention anyways because they're teenage young men and I can't say that I would be this creepy dude drawing his teacher, but I probably wouldn't have been focusing either. Hormone teenage brains, am I right? As Bill looks on at Grant Grant and yes, that's actually his name, and also Starla, it becomes apparent that Bill is interested in Starla, but that ship has long since sailed. Or has it? Maybe they just needed the threat of an alien parasite all along to bring them together. Let's find out. That night, Grant 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 is trying to get frisky. I mean, how would you name your kid Grant if his last name is Grant? Good lord. Anyways, they've got some marriage troubles as Grant picked up Starla at like 17 with a car in college tuition, so their marriage activities aren't exactly popping off. So he goes to the bar and watches some terrible karaoke. Then we get the old Tammy walk up to him. Now her name isn't actually Tammy, but I've always just assumed homewreckers at a bar are named Tammy. Her real name is Brenda. Brenda is clearly interested in Grant. So then they head off into the woods and Grant actually sticks to his marriage and says that he can't do 
this as Starla is probably worried about him. So he's not entirely a bad dude, but then he notices the pile of snot over in the distance. After approaching this pulsating flesh orb, he does what most primates do. He pokes it with a stick, because I mean that worked out great in the blob. Well, the center line of flesh opens up and then fires a dart into his chest. Also, that looks incredibly painful, but now we see what happens, making its way through the base of the sternum and then heads through to the lung area and then up the base of the brain, settling in the cerebellum. Grant wakes up from his apparent knockout, likely due to the electrical shock that the creature put out into his brain. He gets up and then walks back to his truck. Turning home, he begins grabbing all the meat from the fridge. The next morning, Starla apparently wasn't really that worried as she was passed out. Meanwhile, Grant is downstairs building a nest like a total weirdo. But then he hears something. Upstairs, his wife feels bad about the night before, so she's willing to throw him a pity bone. <laughs> That's almost objectively worse than being turned down. But as he watches on like a predator from behind a thin plant, because really that's the parasite controlling him, it seems like maybe there is some human still left in him after all. Anyhow, as he looks at a picture, he connects that they are together. He also starts crying because clearly his brain is stuck in there, but because his cerebellum is not in control of his movements, he is basically trapped. Later, Grant heads to the store and buys just an ungodly amount of meat, or just a dude that's really trying to get swole. Starla then notices that there's been a lock placed in the door, and then we see even more interesting things taking place place. The parasite actively knows when Starla's birthday is, meaning while Grant is also in there, the parasite appears to be fusing into the neural network more effectively as time goes on. However, as Grant watches Starla walk away, his hunger begins rising even further as he goes to secure some dog meat. Later that night, as Starla and Grant get ready to go out, a sort of rash appears on his neck. As Starla tastefully has everything blocked by steam because we aren't monsters here, a real monster walks up with some newly grown appendages. Grant's internal mutation has progressed to the point of having two probuses come out mid-sternum. However, rather than use them on his wife, he's able to overcome what the parasite wants, potentially due to the connection that he has, and instead goes to get Brenda. Meanwhile, at the dear cheer thing, Bill spots Starla alone. But at Brenda's place, Grant shows up and is invited inside. Meanwhile, Bill decides to go talk to Starla and not necessarily make a move, but just do that awkward thing where you want to talk to someone you like, but circumstances have stopped that from being a possibility. It's a classic. So now the mayor talks about random nonsense concerning the deer and cheer. Brenda is ready to get frisky, and as they do... Grant then pulls back his shirt to reveal his mutation has gotten even worse. The probuses then hits her and implants the new Slither monster for her to bear. That's a bummer. Grant also never made it to the deer cheer, so Starla is a little upset. Also, there was a baby at Brenda's house, so what happened to that baby? No one knows. Heading home herself, she runs into him as his face is swollen. He tells her that it's just a bee sting, but brother, it's not a bee sting. Grant then lies, saying that Dr. Carl said that it'll get better later on. So, Starla then calls Dr. Carl the next morning, and he tells tells her that he hasn't seen Grant in over a year. Starla also noticed there's like a crazy amount of missing pets all over the place. Later that night, Grant heads back into the woods to an abandoned barn. Brenda is there and extra hungry. He drops the meat to her as apparently she is literally starving. Back at the homestead, Bill and Wally show up to question Grant about the disappearance of Brenda, but he's not there. This alerts Starla that maybe some tomfoolery has been going on. Because of this, she decides to break off the lock to the door and actually see what's down there because, uh, you know, that whole thing's just a little strange. Opening the door flies immediately fly out and she's hit with a terrible smell. Heading down, she finds all the missing pets and some coyotes and, ah, poor house cats. Starla runs up the stairs to call Bill, but then we see old Grant is just outside looking worse than ever. She makes a break for it, but is grabbed by Grant as he tries to infect her too, but gets smacked in the head with an end table. As his body begins to change, Bill runs in with his squad and asks what we would all ask as Grant runs off. You can see his mouth move, so we all know what it is. We now jump ahead to three days later. At this point, the mayor is involved and he's upset that Grant hasn't been found yet. He suggests that maybe it's just Lyme disease and not an alien menace. Animals have been getting grabbed at the edge of town for the last three days. As the mayor continues to question why he hasn't been found, there's over 100,000 acres of wood around the town, so it's going to be hard to find him, but they begin to find a pattern to figure out where he's likely to hit that night. So they lock and load Brides of Christ and start to head out, but are confronted by Starla. She's trying to get them to stop and make Bill promise to bring him back alive, or she's coming with. So she's coming with. We now flash over to a family that loves one another, which, lord, we already know how this is gonna go. They are there to pick up Otis to protect his farm for the night. As the darkness descends, everyone is just sort of sitting around and hiding. Bill and Wally and Starla are sitting and talking about how Starla tried to get Bill to run away to Hollywood with her, which didn't work. Judging by the current circumstances, I think maybe they should have left. But the mayor notices the squid monster Grant coming through the area and approaching a cow. As it squares up on the cow, it takes it out and then begins to pull the animal away. Starla runs out to confront Grant as the rest of the group goes after her. Starla 
calls out to Grant as the confrontation now begins. His mutations are quite extensive at this point. Looks like Grant is considering the possibility of leaving without stacking bodies, but then one guy wants to be a hero and literally gets bisected sagittally. <laughs> Ow! And as they run through the woods chasing Grant, they quickly lose him, but Wally gets back on his trail. This leads Bill to find the snot all over the place near an abandoned farmhouse. Getting close, they smell something terrible inside and hear Brenda crying. They do rock, paper, scissors, which actually, if you didn't know, males are more likely to throw rock in a game of rock, paper, scissors, whereas actually women typically throw scissors or paper more often. So now you know that and you could beat your friends. But as they enter the barn, they find Brenda is not looking too good. In fact, well past the point of what the integumentary system should be capable of. Bill asks her how she's doing, but she mentions how hungry she is and asks for the possum. As she talks, she realizes that she's actually being torn apart by a bunch of slug monsters that begin getting released and then entering everyone's mouth. Bill and Starla cover these areas as the creatures are denied access and then head out into the wilderness towards the town. Back at the farm, that was the closest place apparently, and as the teenager uses the bath, we see one of the creatures crawls across the window. Ignoring her mother, because teenager, she puts in her earphones as the family does family stuff and then goes to bed. Back in the bath, we see one of these creatures coming after the girl. Her name is Kylie, by the way, I don't think I ever mentioned that. As it enters her mouth, we see visions of what the hive mind has done as it has taken over entire species previously and fused them into one giant mass, as well as everything that Grant has seen. Kylie is able to survive the attack, but her family isn't so lucky. Exiting the bathroom, her mom has already been gone. Next, her sisters are also got by these things that are all over the house. Exiting onto the roof, which the roof cannot be up to code, there's like zero slope to it. If it rains, they're screwed because that's just going to rot out the back portion of their house. But the dad comes out of the house and falls down as he's been infected as well. She runs to the truck, but the slugs aren't able to get in. Meanwhile, back at the barn, Bill calls back to town for a paramedic as some of the officers are still dropped. The mayor is freaking out, claiming he's never seen anything like this before on Animal Planet as Bill heads back to town. Carrying the cops out of the barn, Starla goes to some water as Wally sits back up. Wally begins repeating what Grant would say to her, showing that he's under control of the creature. Meanwhile, Kylie's family has now entered the fray. Trying to get her to open the door, they're clearly not doing so hot on Family Fun Day. Back at the barn, the entire group is talking as Grant, as clearly ah, this is a hive mind sort of deal. Starla takes out Wally, but only had one shell, so her and the mayor are forced to run. Also, the female cop got some acid on her neck, which took her out. As Bill comes across the scene at the farmhouse, he asks what's going on. Otis tells him poison ivy maybe. Well, that checks out. But as Kylie says they aren't her parents anymore, she says the worms are also in their brain. Bill gets attacked by the rest of the group as again, they're all controlled by Grant and targeting Bill as he's picked up, or at least Grant's picked up, that maybe Bill has a thing for Starla. Bill rescues the group. Well, Starla also straight up takes out a dude, and they all drive back to town as family fun day appears to be over. As Bill keeps calling back into town, finally Shelby answers the dispatch line. Bill tells Shelby to get the CDC on the line, and <laughs> What are those nerds gonna do? But as Shelby goes to do this, the creatures break into the building. Kylie now speaks up after Jack's freak out about no Mr. Pib and talks about where the worms are coming from. She says the creatures come from other worlds and planets and gets the creature pregnant and then takes over the entire world. It's essentially a conscious disease. Shelby also has been infected at this point, but what's interesting is she knows exactly where the truck is at a specific point in time while talking to them. I get the hive mind aspect, but how they communicate must be beyond our normal level of proximity. Anyhow, now, as they get ripped out of the car by the infected, the entire town appears to have been taken over as Bill and Kylie are the only two who were able to escape. Bill now devises a plan. A concussive force applicator is in the police station for some reason, and he says he's gonna go get it, and he will be right back and tells Kylie to stay hidden. As he enters, he finds that something is moving in the darkness, and none of the lines work. Going to grab some force multipliers, well, if it isn't the deer that was infected earlier. The deer begins attacking him, but Kylie ends up saving his tail, which he remarks that, you know, this will actually be spun as him saving her. But Kylie says once one of them has seen them, then they all see them, so they need to go. Meanwhile, Starla is placed in a bed and cleaned up by the rest of the hive mind. Kylie asks as they watch on, basically a bunch of people getting got by these things, what do they do now? And Bill says, well, probably turn into those things. Which, I don't know, makes me laugh, because you know, it's just anti-hero. Anyways, Starla now wakes up and hears a bunch of voices telling her to come down. Meanwhile, the mayor wakes up in a less agreeable location. Flipping on his lighter, he sees that the infected are eating some of the meat in the base as then he runs upstairs, he opens the door and is immediately impaled by two of the probuses. Jack then falls downstairs and has now joined the horde as he starts eating meat off the arm of a person. Darla then finds the creepy room of pictures, which is always a good sign, of her and Grant. Walking into the next room, she finds Grant is looking like a slug monster, and somehow he's gotten even worse from earlier. People are joining the horde and fusing into the mass to become a super organism. Starla is able to convince Grant that she was just freaking out over him, you know, appearing like he wanted to end her and all, and that she really just needed an adjustment 
replacement, period. <laughs> okay. So she's able to get in close and then hits him in the neck with a sharp piece of a mirror. Jack at this point hears the fight outside taking place and finds Bill entering through the front door. Again, one of my favorite movies because Jack is just like, he's taken out and there's like no hesitation or worry from Bill. He just does it casually because he just asked for it. What does that humor say about me and you? Who knows? Moving on. As Grant's form yells that he's been around for millions of years, how do you think you can screw with him? Bill runs around the corner with a concussive force applicator saying, yep. And then this is immediately knocked from his hands, so I guess nope. Attempting to find it, Bill grabs it and then is knocked outside as it rolls into the pool and detonates. Which, whoops. So now we see this uh, pleasant experience for Grant to release the baby things in people's stomach. But as Bill has stopped the other line from entering his abdomen, he's able to attach a propane line, which then begins feeding fuel into the body of the Grant monster. He tells Starla to fire some lead to ignite it. As she does, this ignites the entire interior of the creature, destroying the central control of the hive mind. Because the control is officially severed at this point, the rest of the infected everywhere begin dropping as the worms are not necessarily conscious, but instead just act as a conduit to the original hive mind. After taking out the creature, Kylie pushes the couch over, showing that she survived, and Bill is on the ground, coughing up and leaking fluids after the horrible experience he just had. As they exit that morning, having thwarted the takeover of Earth, Bill mentions how he regretted never running off to Hollywood and then requests Kylie tell Starla how he saved her from that deer. So now we have like a 10 mile hike to the next town, or you could just hotwire that truck over there. Whichever. So I believe the first place we should start is where does this creature come from exactly? How did it fly across the open void of space? And what sort of adaptations would actually allow for it to do this? Because if you take up all its forms and plot it out, it actually shows you throughout the movie how it is capable of doing what it does. Then we'll move on to the actual effects of the parasite to the hive mind blob that is likely to become, should it take over and assimilate all the species on the planet, basically the only thing left here. Starting with the parasite itself, this is what you would call a hive mind parasite, as you may have guessed. Its only goal is to spread across the known and likely unknown galaxy and potentially the universe. To accomplish its goals, what it appears to do is two possibilities. Either it attacks more advanced species as well as more primitive ones, likely indiscriminately, by creating the pods that we have seen and just flinging them across the universe, or it is selectively attacking anything that it may find. I'm inclined to believe that it's possibly a combination of both of these, however, and there are several reasons for this. But before getting to this specific point, we must make a designation as far as what this parasite becomes, because that is going to be important. There appears to be four stages of the hive mind, all with different jobs concerning how they take over a planet. Initially, you have the original cedar. Now, the parasite itself is called the long one, and this is a form of species that composes itself into basically a needle-like creature. The needle's job is to survive the trip across space, being exposed to all types of radiation and harsh conditions. Likely this form, as it flies across space, is in some sort of hibernation until it lands. The best comparison I can draw is how bacteria, when in unfavorable environments, will enter its own state where it becomes extremely resistant to high temperatures, desiccation, chemical agents, and even radiation. Known as an endospore, it is essentially a vegetative spore that will drift through on wind currents to hopefully more favorable areas, where it will awaken and begin dividing. This protected spore has a tougher exterior, as you might imagine, which gives it these abilities. It can stay alive for an extremely long time, with reports of them surviving up to 10,000 years in this state, with some having claimed that they revived some as old as a couple million years old. As you can tell, this form tracks perfectly with what the needle would be exposed to. The needle with its hard exterior is also encased in a type of goo that will allow it to survive the impact of the planet as well as heat generated from entry into the atmosphere. Once landed, it will crack open and release a fleshy pod that will act as a firing mechanism into any animal that should happen by. Should this species land on a planet without any life, this will basically be the end and the needle will not progress past this point as there is nothing to assimilate. In fact, it may even continue to hibernate until life does arise on said planet. However, landing on Earth, there is plenty of life all around for the needle to infect, and in fact, it does. As the luckiest unlucky primate on the planet just happens by, Grant is infected after he pokes it with a stick. I break away to once again tell you that should you find something like this, throwing a rock at it is preferable to poking it with a stick. Just come on, remember your roots. We chased away the saber-toothed cats first and foremost by throwing rocks at them as a group. I mean, if you really think about it, now we're just throwing lead with gunpowder. God, we have not progressed that much. Anyhow, this will ultimately result in the primary host. The primary host is the person who is infected with the needle and will be the center of the hive mind as essentially what basically the brain of the operation is to all those that will be assimilated. The needle works its way through the chest of a person or animal or anything else as it is drawn by the electrical activity of the brain, likely indicating that it has electric receptors, sort of like how sharks can sense electrical fields. And this will actually be an important adaptation, which we will discuss later. The higher electrical fields put off by the brain would outclass the spinal cord or other nerves, indicating that the needle would need to hit the area with the most activity. Once entering the brain, 
point, it will settle in the cerebellum of humans, which is where movement comes from, at least for the most part. Other areas of the brain are associated with movement of humans, but the cerebellum acts as what is essentially the main component of movement. In fact, if you would like an example of, well, there's other places where movement may come from, uh, there's actually a man who basically snapped his spinal cord in half and was paralyzed. Having not walked in basically forever, they wanted to do a test to see if the muscle would still contract using a spinal stimulator, and what they found out was applying the spinal stimulator to the disconnected portion of the spinal cord and having him think about moving his big toe, which if you've seen Kill Bill, I know, but literally they're like, move your big toe. He was actually able to move it by thinking about it. So where does movement come from? Well, it turns out that the spinal cord is apparently a part of your brain and not just a bridge that has been thought of for basically the entire time we've known about it. Anyways, here's where the movement of humans will be controlled, but the cerebrum appears to be still intact and functional throughout the infection process. Now, eventually even the cerebrum will be affected as the influence of the needle grows as it familiarizes itself with the neurology of humans. And as the needle also grows, a couple of things will happen internally with the primary host as well. First, the deformities of the integument system will begin to show up as splotches first as the immune system is likely being activated by the presence of this alien. Showing up as inflammation, this is the body's innate immune system attempting to fight the parasite off. Then as the fight becomes more dire, the host's immune system will begin releasing more nuclear options, almost to the point of anaphylactic shock within the body. This, however, will not be enough. Due to the positioning of the parasite being that it is in the brain, the blood-brain barrier prevents a lot of immune system cells from being able to actively attack the parasite. Plus, the actual size of the parasite as it continues to grow ultimately makes it impossible for the immune system to do away with it. Eventually, the immune system will be depleted after a few days of this fight, which absolutely likely does happen. In fact, to the point that, take measles for instance, it can essentially wipe the memory of the immune system as your body throws everything including the kitchen sink at this disease. This can leave you in a weaker, more susceptible state for months after the infection is cleared because you literally have used so many cells to fight. It's pretty crazy. That and, I mean, you also don't remember any previous diseases that you fought, or at least your immune system doesn't, which is also pretty crazy. Anyhow, this is what your body is doing to try to get rid of the needle, but it is unsuccessful, which this is exactly what the parasite wants if it is to add to the giant flesh growth. Because should the immune system remain viable, this may damage the cells of others, and this would not allow an easy joining together as seen with those who approach the primary host later on. Once your body has lost the fight, we begin to see other changes within it. The deformities grow in severity. The host's structural system seems to begin changing slowly at first, but we also see growth of new internal appendages. And what can be considered the sexual organs of the needle, these will backtrack likely out of the cerebellum where the brain of the creature is hosted inside of your brain to the original entry point that the needle first took. These two appendages both need to enter another host in order to implant the egg larva and likely the sperm. Now, what appears to be the larva is introduced with also some sort of fluid, which is gross, but that either wakes it up or causes it to actually gestate, which would indicate that this is an asexual organism. The reason this would be important to keep separate as the primary host is you do not want the slugs forming within your vessel, as if this happens, which we will see, things will get quite detrimental pretty quickly. Receiving one of the proboscis to the guts will not allow you to be infected as seen when Bill is able to hold off the other one. Those that are properly infected like Brenda, however, will become a host known as the womb. The womb has one purpose, produce slugs. When infected, it seems they go into a convulsive shock at first, but as the slugs begin to wake up within the intestines of the womb, it seems to me that they will attach to the stomach and intestines of the host. Once attached, they will do what parasites do and begin feeding on whatever you are feeding on. Brenda remarks how she's so hungry and that you shouldn't judge her, and because everything she eats goes immediately to the slugs and consumed by them, leaving her nutrition lacking, which leads to more hunger. You may also be inclined to believe that there is a slug in her brain, but the reality is if you were as hungry as her, you would probably do the same. There is a concept, which I have mentioned a few times before, but you will actually eat anything if you're hungry enough. Essentially, your hypothalamus becomes altered if you are in starvation mode. And really, nothing is off the table, up to and including roadkill and other humans. The survival technique is firmly rooted in our species and appears to be rooted in others as well, as the womb's hunger is used to fuel the growth of the slugs. After injection, it appears the primary host is an asexual reproductive animal, as mentioned previously, because this is likely sperm and eggs that will mix within the womb and become slugs. As the slugs grow, the size of the womb will also increase, which is a statement that I would never want to again say in my life, and then likely the womb's muscles are used to a degree as nutrition, and the intestines are spared to keep her hungry and alive. However, the integument system is severely altered, as if you didn't know, there's no way you could grow to this size that quickly without basically just popping a seam. But just past the integument system lies the writhing mass. But eventually she will split open once the slugs have reached some form of maturity, usually within a couple of days. Once this has happened, 
happen, they will exit the womb to the host's destruction and then move out into the surrounding area. Their only goal is to find biomass for the primary host to absorb. The slugs themselves are not like the needle which creates the primary host. Instead, they can be likened to worker ants, as they do not reproduce themselves and are really controlled by the queen. This would indicate that this species, while a conscious disease, is also a eusocial species. Once coming across a suitable host, they will enter through the mouth, and based on the convulsions that we see, they too will be compelled to enter the brain of the host. However, unlike the needle who does not appear to destroy the brain, the size of the slug entering the brain case will in fact destroy a large portion of it. They appear to reside within about the center of the brain and begin linking up neurons in order to control the host. Because of the brain matter that is destroyed in the process, this means that if the connection with the primary host is lost, they will drop and the body will be donezo despite no control being influenced. Without the queen, they are lost and so is the infected body. One of the interesting aspects of the slugs is their defense mechanisms though. Should another body become aware of the infected, a fluid is spit out that appears to cause instant swelling. What appears to be happening is pressure in the area is increased until the skin bursts. So potentially it would be acidic at first to bypass the skin cells and then cause swelling after it's already seeped in. Once there, depending on the location, this can rob the host of fluids in other areas, potentially leading to them being subdued as a critical loss of fluids, say if you're hit in the neck, is definitely going to draw blood and water away from your brain to that area. But also what it does is it bursts the skin. Again, that's an important thing that would allow the slugs to enter your body. Slugs are controlled almost telepathically by the primary host. Whatever they see, the primary host sees. Then the primary host can relay movement and information to the slug, which is acting as a conduit for the hive mind. The slugs, however, do retain this link both ways, as when Kylie gets a slug in her mouth, already she saw visions of other planets, so imagine the slug is essentially a giant neuron. Once close enough to your brain, the electrical signals can cause a pattern to fire within your brain, causing you to see what the primary host knows. Which is interesting, as this indicates that neurologically, animals across the galaxy would be set up in a similar manner. Once the slugs have fully controlled the body, they will then be compelled to return back to the primary host. This is likely after the immune system has been subdued as not to cause issues. Once joining with the host, the slugs would likely then move within the primary host body, but the infection and control is complete, so this is no longer an issue, just basically rejoining the hive. Now, on other planets, this resulted in species across the entire world being formed into one giant mass of controllable flesh. Once doing this, the creature would continue to spread out, but the question is, how? Well, we know that they are somehow launched into space, but this is actually a completely feasible thing for the primary host to do itself. And we have seen this ability actually used in his smaller form prior to the slug outbreak. When the one guy who gets bisected tries to stop Grant, and that fleshy appendage basically whips him in half, the movement was so quick it's barely noticeable. But at that speed like that, imagine how fast something could be thrown. Now at that size, obviously that's not leaving the atmosphere. But once you take into consideration all the species on the planet and subsequently the biomass associated with that, you are talking about a mass that is massive enough with potentially tentacles that are miles in length. A whip that size, with that speed, with that much force, could easily likely achieve escape velocity of a planet, and then just straight up start flinging spores off of it. So this brings us back to the idea of do they attack intelligent species or do they attack only primitive ones? I would personally believe it's a combination based on luck, but also knowledge. Remember, it being a conscious disease, it keeps brains alive, which means the more mass it adds, the smarter it gets as a host. Based on this, if it should land on a planet of regular animals, its goal then becomes to fling out spores until likely completely used up and can no longer send spores into space. But because it's still one organism, it likely still has contact with other versions of itself who may have landed on more advanced species planets, which we will get to how they discuss anything in a moment. In this case, that means once assimilating those species, it would likely learn the location of other planets based on that species' knowledge of the cosmos, and should they be more advanced or advanced enough, may even learn of planets that are currently housing life and those are chosen. To me, this seems likely as space is pretty big if you didn't know. For something like that to land on our planet, either the creature is throwing out billions of these spores in random directions, which I doubt the biomass obtained would be enough to fulfill this, as if the equations are off by even just a little bit, they will miss the planet entirely and then just keep floating by. Or these are targeted attacks with mathematics involved. This indicates to me that humans are once again confirmed to be the most lucky, unlucky bastards in the galaxy. For our species to arise cosmically, just bear with me on this, depending on what you believe in, even based on just probability, it's just ridiculous because of the location of Saturn and Jupiter and how they had to basically be in a dance that likely pulled apart ancient super-Earths, which we could have absolutely not formed on, then flinging Saturn out further into the solar system so Jupiter could stop asteroids from constantly wiping out life here to the primordial soup containing enough water and chemicals to form amino acid chains spawned by lightning strikes, then life being stable enough on this planet 
and the planet itself not wiping us out over the last billion years, to then the pinnacle being humans, who are capable of leaving the planet entirely with our brains being the culmination of a ridiculous amount of luck and just the right circumstances. All of this coming together, and then you meeting your end by choking on a ham sandwich. See? The luckiest unlucky bastards out there. But the last thing I'd like to cover is a little more thorough breakdown of what happens to your meat suit as you are infected to become the primary host. It's clear shortly after Grant's infection, we get a good view of it heading to his brain. We also see an electrical discharge, which would induce a seizure, knocking him unconscious as seen when he continues to lay there and shake. This is to subdue the host so they do not seek help, and it may even actually erase their memory, or possibly not do something that could endanger the needle once it enters the brain. Once nestled in the cerebellum, this will initially cause the creature to have complete control over the host. I say initially, as later, we will see Grant resist. The movements are shaky at first, and Grant seems confused more than anything. This is likely because his cerebrum is still unconscious. Basically, the lights are on, but nobody's home. After the cerebrum wakes back up, you can see this when it happens. Grant's baser instincts return at first, as the needle is in full control of his body. Now, for a less neurologically complex animal, this probably would be how it remains for the rest of the time. However, eventually Grant comes back too as the cerebrum boots back up when he's standing there with Starla and he starts crying as he's basically stuck in his meat suit. Over time, as the needle continues to merge with the neurological system, it becomes a slight internal struggle. I say slight because there is no way Grant is going to be able to actually successfully override this parasite 100%. He can in other ways though. In fact, in one instance, we see him attempt to go turn Starla into the womb. And again, a lesser animal would just do it. But with our larger brains, there's more on the line than just breeding, so he's able to resist. However, with someone that he really doesn't have a strong connection with, Brenda, he is overcome by the creature. As the infection progresses more and more, eventually the biochemistry of the body has changed itself. We talked about the immune system, but cells themselves are likely directed by the parasite via hormones. This would have several impacts on the body, as you can tell. The first would likely be the activation of the osteoclast, which would weaken bones in certain areas, such as when Grant's arm begins to extend. The original bone framework would need to be changed, which would require its strength to be diminished. This happens all over the body as many parts were restructured to what the parasite wants. After a few days, these bones would be positioned into new appendages and re-strengthened using osteoblasts, as well as probably human growth hormone and a plethora of other human hormones, and this would allow the new limbs to work quite effectively and taking apart others. Some of the bone restructuring would take the form of claws as well as proboscis, as seen with the two injectors that come out of his chest. The other areas that would be altered would be the brain itself. It probably hasn't gone unnoticed by the parasite that another consciousness is actively changing the movements of the body. But what's interesting is, likely in an effort to destroy this with the prefrontal lobe residing on the other side of the brain, as the needle more firmly connects with the brain, the struggle for control becomes a merging of the two consciousness, meaning both are now in control of the body by the end stage. While Grant does love Starla, the parasite loves biomass, so Grant is able to override it concerning strong feelings, but the parasite is able to override Grant if a weak connection is there. This would indicate that it's almost like they both have equal control in the later stages as to overtake the body completely. The parasite must completely integrate into the body, allowing it to also be subjected to the will of Grant. Again, with less intelligent species, likely this is a non-issue. The other likely thing to happen to the meat suit is the breakdown of cellular barriers in the integument system. Typically, our skin is a stalwart protector of our internals, so once again, Grant enters the later stages and has people fusing with him, so the skin he has would almost extend into the skin of those who are infected by slugs, allowing them to become conjoined as those cells divide at the discretion of the long one parasite. One organ that would seem to form, however, besides the appendages in the chest, is something to interpret signals. We know that with the infected, they receive information almost simultaneously from their primary infected host. To do so, they need to be communicating beyond compressional waves by sound or by scent. This would indicate that likely a form of electrical field detection from the primary host is how it's done. Considering they are all sensitive to electrical fields anyways, this would make the most amount of sense as they can feel the fields and do what they need to do at the speed of light. This may also indicate that there is a limited range between communicating between planets, but that signal may still be sent out to the original host depending on distances and the others who have completely ransacked their planet can communicate and boost that signal along the way. And this is almost confirmed when the parasite says that it's been around for millions of years because this communication that might take place between planets and systems could take thousands if not hundreds of thousands of years for a signal to travel that far so even then it may scatter and fade over time but they may still be able to communicate with one another. Ultimately I believe the long one parasite is something that is quite adapted for sentient animals but not something that is as good at dealing with sapient creatures like us. Because of this once coming across our species this may have rendered the time necessary 
necessary to make it not as successful in infecting our entire planet. That said, however, for it to even hit Earth, either we are incredibly unlucky and it's lucky, or it was aimed at us. This being the case may in itself show it is designed by another species to take over all life on the planet, or itself may have infected a species that was aware of life on our planet. Either way, humans being what humans are, we're able to overcome it, but considering likely there are more spores flying through space and this thing is officially aware of humans, at that point in time, there may have actually already been more being thrown at our planet, or at least potentially the call went out to throw more at our planet. But I want to hear what you guys think though, considering this was like a remake because the other one got Shreked, I hope you enjoyed it regardless, and if you did, leaving a like would be great and subscribing is a great way to stay up to date on what I post. I'll drop my Twitter, Discord, Patreon, Roanoke Tales, and Croatoan channel where I'm currently dunking on absolutely horrible medical takes on Twitter, so if that sounds interesting, you should check it out. Speaking of patrons though, I would like to thank my first huge thank you to our two astronauts, Aegis, as well as our new astronaut, Wesley A. Weaver Jr. Thank you guys. I'd also like to thank our astrophysicist, Death Dancer, as well as our scientists, Leon and Wolfie420ZA. For the rest of my patrons, I thank you guys as well. I really do appreciate your continued support. All right, so that's going to do it for me. I hope everyone enjoyed. Hope your allergies aren't, you know, completely ruining your life like mine are, and I will see y'all in the next one.